tell me everything that happened. The first time I visited death row, I wasn't expecting to meet somebody the same age as me. From a neighborhood just like ours. Could have been me, mama. But what you're doing is gonna make a lot of people upset. But you always taught me to fight for the people who need the help most. Your life is still meaningful, and I'm gonna do everything possible to keep them from taking it. You only know what you're into down here in Alabama when you're guilty from the moment you're born. God. Mr. McMillan. We done here. Mr. McMillan, please. I was just about to give up when I got a call from a Harvard lawyer looking to start a legal center for inmates on death row. I was in before he even offered me the job. You the lawyer? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for driving all the way out here. Most lawyers barely make time to call. I can't believe you talked to all my people and said you are going to fight for me. I did. That mean a lot. If you go digging in those wounds, you're going to be making a lot of people very unhappy. When people care about a thing that much, they'll do anything to get what they want. When I first learned about all this, it was like looking at a river full of drowning people and not having any way of helping them. You ain't quit, Miss. No, sir. Each of us is more than the worst thing that we've ever done. I know what it's like to be in the shadows. It's my dad. He did nothing wrong. It's never too late for justice. You're the only one kid enough to fight for me. If we can look at ourselves closely, we can change this world for the better. We all need grace. We all need mercy. By the way, we're all at the back here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Are you guys looking cool or are you clowning? I'm, oh, I'm, I'm okay, really okay. Cool. Okay. <laughs> okay, guys. Good. Okay, I'm happy to. Justin, you'll just wait one sec because your chair is on the back end. I think we're good to go. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the, uh, the conference here for Just Mercy. You can see this incredible, uh, uh, talented, uh, and, and important panel here today talking about a pretty important film. Thanks, everybody, for doing this. I mean, just let's start with you, Dustin. When you're putting a film like this together, I don't have to ask anybody why you'd want to do a film like this. That should be pretty ob obvious. But why did you? Th what did you think you could bring to this? What? <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, I I think what I what I hoped I could bring to this was um, an open heart and uh, my ability to listen and learn from this man, Brian Stevenson, who uh, taught me more over the course of making this movie than I've than I've learned in my entire life, and it, it, it truly was a life changing experience for me. You know, Brian, this isn't just about a case or your story, because this is an ongoing thing. This is a crisis now. I mean, the numbers be in, in incarcerated in the US from 1972 to today are overwhelmingly different. So when you have to present this story and be part of this and see this cast put it together, there's more on the line than did Michael B. Jordan look better than I did. Like, there's more. <laughs> You know, you know. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Make, I'm not passing judgment. That's for others. It's close um, rooms. Close rooms. Right. <laughs> no, but like it's a real thing. This. Well, I think that's right. I mean, I what what motivated me to write the book? I mean, I've been in the courts for 30 years. We've been fighting for people who are on death row, fighting for people wrongly convicted and unfairly sentenced. And I was initially persuaded that we could get courts to respond and we could achieve justice. I'm a product 
of Brown versus Board of Education. I grew up in a community where black kids couldn't go to public schools, and it was the court that opened those doors. The political environment would never have tolerated an end to racial segregation. So I believed in that. And about 10 years ago, I realized that we probably couldn't win Brown versus Board of Education in the US today. I don't think our court today would do something that disruptive on behalf of poor or disenfranchised people. And that's because the larger environment has become so tolerant of inequality. We've accepted so much bigotry and injustice. So it was important to start talking in a broader space about these issues. And you're right, what's happened in America over the last half century is tragic. Uh, we had 300,000 people in jails and prisons in 1972, 2.2 million today, 6 million people on probation and parole. There are 70 million Americans with criminal arrests, which means that when they try to get jobs or loans, they're disfavored. Women going to prison increased 646% in the last 25 years. And there's this statistic, one in three black male babies born in America is expected to go to jail or prison, and nobody's talking about it. And so getting a story out there that got people to understand that these are not just data, these are not just stories, these are human tragedies. This is suffering, this is cruel, this is abusive, became a priority, and that's why it's been so exciting uh, to be a part of a process where some of the most talented people in the world have given their all, and that's what's moved me most about the performances. Everybody up here um, didn't just know their lines, just didn't know their, 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 their spaces. Uh, they gave their hearts to this project, and you see it in the film. And I think and I hope that people will have a better appreciation for why we should never tolerate inequality. We should never tolerate injustice. And that's what's exciting to me about this process, is that maybe we can break down some of the indifference that's allowed these problems to persist. So Michael, when you step up to play this character and get that across, how much did you know about Brian? How much did you know about these stats? I mean, you were in the wire, so you know about what the political ramifications, the police ramifications, the court ramifications, you know this. But when you connected to this story, how, how close were you to it? Um, I think for me, <clears throat> you know, uh, answering your question about how much did I know about Brian, I, I, I admit that I was very embarrassed I didn't know that much, you know, in the beginning. You know, once I got introduced to the book and got a chance to read, uh, to listen, listen to his TED talk, and uh, it, it I, I was, uh, I felt a huge responsibility to run towards this issue, to run towards the story, to try to do whatever I could to use my platform to get the story out to the masses. I knew that that would uh, ultimately try to give him a tool, you know, uh, something to help him uh, do his job. You know, the fact that he is in these Supreme Courts, you know, uh, you know, fighting these cases, fighting this cause day in and day out. How could we do our part? And that's kind of what I brought, you know, what I wanted to bring to, to this issue, to this project. Jim, you saw this direct directly hit your family. You saw this directly hit your family, this system. Oh yeah, I mean, it, 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 like when you're talking about the culture of going to jail if you're black, it, it, it's, it's weird, it almost becomes so commonplace that we embrace it a little. Think about what we do, we rap about it. We, it, it became a, a, a badge, um, it, it became so commonplace and to experience it with your own father, like my stepfather taught me how to throw a curveball. He, he taught me how to play football. He, 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 would, he would not only teach kids in the inner city for 25 years, but he would mentor them on Sundays. You know, he had the kids play basketball, so they would stay out of the streets. He would bring a judge into the school to talk to the kids. The, you know, the judge would say, hey, you know, stay out of trouble. And then the next thing you know, my father, for $25 worth of illegal substance, which is now legal, they put him in jail for seven years. The and same kids he was mentoring. The same to. kids he's mentoring, he's now in jail with them. I fought these, fought these guys at that time, um, saying like, this is, you know, it's ridiculous. And then I find out behind it, and he know, it's a business. You know, behind it all, it's like, the more they put in jail, the more money they make, but they don't understand like, what you do to that family. Um, and, and, it's, it, and when you see Walter McMillan, when he talks about, you know, my family doesn't want to come and see me anymore because we can't hold on to that emotion. Black people, or, or people that are affected like this, I call it emotional finance. You have your emotional finance, you can pay for the struggles that you're going through already outside of jail. I can't pay for all of that as well, so therefore I don't go see my father, my brother, whoever's it. So this movie is a blessing 
that we get a chance to be with all of these beautiful creative people. And I told uh, Destin last night what you guys did, Michael B. Brian, what you did in putting the movie together. There's gonna be a lot of stories told about the black experience, but this is, is beautiful, it's eloquent. It's, just, it's not this. And, and you can, you know what I'm saying? It's like, because we worry, like if it's too much this, and even when they test the movie and they test the movie first and they said, well, Jamie had tested it as 97 for an all black audience, right? And then they said, well, you want to hear the numbers for the all white audience? I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> what they say, 98. So huge congratulations to what you guys did putting it in the, in the, in the right atmosphere so this message can really touch and change people's thinking of our perception. There's so many layers to it. Uh, Rob, we'll get to your character a bit, who was guilty, but Karen, the idea of family and keeping everything together and not going to visit, and he had done you wrong in the movie, so he wasn't clean either, <laughs> but the concept of forgiveness and all of that, what was it like for you to, to play that character? It was a really interesting concept to explore because it's easy to embrace and champion someone when they are quote unquote blameless. But who among us is actually blameless? And uh, there's a quote uh, from Brian Stevenson that says, you know, none of us, I'm paraphrasing, but we are not the definition of our greatest day or our worst day. You know, and there's so much that lives in between. I think that what I carry from this work and from this process is the, the importance of humanity. And I feel like that's really one of the stronger things that we're, we're, we're sh showcasing here. I'm human just like you. I mess up just like you. I want great things just like you. I want love and compassion and understanding and mercy. I need it just like you. I require it just like you like you. And so it's so important that we see that you don't have to be perfect to receive those things. You don't have to be right to get those things. Your existence as a human being on the planet grants you access to those things. That raises that fundamental question. <laughs> it's just a, watching the film, it, there's just a fundamental question the audience has to ask themselves is what world do you want? What country do you want? What city do you want? What county do you want? Because it's choices that get it to you. Your character was guilty. And you guys had to explain to him, Shay, that they don't get the right to take your life because of what you did. Um, but you didn't know anything. There wasn't much on this guy that you played. How do you wrap your head around such an important character? Uh, well, I... Uh being a black man in America, I can identify with uh, a lot of the, the information that was in the script as far as the oppression, as far as the uh, societal, just trying to, to manipulate our image so that we can wind up in these positions and people will tolerate it because they don't care. And I think that's one of the beautiful things Jamie is alluding to about this movie is how it put black men in a humanistic form that can allow our stories to be digestible enough for people to actually take us seriously and want to be proactive and create some type of, some type of justice for everybody and not just focus on one particular group, make them uh, guilty because they're not financially secure and make them uh, um, innocent because they're rich, you know? And uh, my particular character, Herbert Richardson, um, young man, haven't even had his first kiss, goes off to war, experienced some traumatic, heavy war situations, fortunately survives that, comes back. How does he know how to communicate? Meets a young woman, shows him some affection, feels good, things go awry, she moves away. How does he follow that feeling? What does he want to say to her? How does he know how to communicate? He was basically brought up with war. So in his mind, the way to communicate love is through war. Put a bomb there, it goes off, I can go in and save her and she'll love me for the rest of her life. Mind you, this man sacrificed his life for this country, but when he came back to this country, there wasn't any support system. No mental health support, 
no spiritual, emotional support, so he's pretty much left on his own vices. And when you're left like that, you know, how you react, is it somebody else's position to judge and, and say, hey, you deserve this penalty? You know, and that's kind of the questions that I'm hoping that can be uh, asked through people watching this movie, you know, uh, because ideally I'm pretty sure 85 to 90 percent of the people in this room never even had a direct connection to that kind of story. You see what I'm saying? And now that you know that this kind of story exists, like the young lady Karen was asking last night, what's your something you gonna do about it? You know, are you gonna sit back and tolerate that? Because with us sitting in this room right now, I guarantee you some injustices is happening right now, right at this moment, you know? So hopefully, uh, yeah, Herbert Richardson can start challenging the, the community to ask, all right, what's my something? What can I do? What was your experience like, Bree? Because what was great about this film was that, was that there was no great white hope in this film. And you didn't have to play the great white hope character, which is usually no, what's No, there's so much hope. They don't need me to be <laughs> hope. Um, it was just, a, as you can see, just from the last, you know, however long hearing these people talk, I, it was just, I just was humbled to be allowed in that room, to be there. Um, it was an opportunity for me to be like the truest, most fundamental definition of supporting to just support, and mostly to support Michael while he supported and played this character that was serving so many other people. And so when Destin asked me to do this, my first question was, does Michael want me there? And he was like, yes, of course. <laughs> like, yes. I was like, okay, then I can do it. Because to me, it was just, that's the role that I was, that I was playing, to not, um, to not save, but just to listen and to just to be there and to hold space and to learn. And I, you know, had to, so many of us, I mean, we shared so much sitting in that courtroom, watching your case play out over and over and over again. And it was like, I don't think there was one take where we didn't feel it. And so to have that type of experience with these people, um, and to share the conversations that we shared, a lot of which Jamie led, that were so impactful to me. I just felt immense gratitude to be um, seen as a person that was safe enough to be in that space while all of these people were incredibly vulnerable. So I'm grateful. There's this really important moment, and it speaks a lot to what you do, but in this film where you illustrate that you're taught to not get close to your clients. You're taught to not be personal with them. And such a huge part of this film, you know, how important it was to your to Walter that you went to the family, that moment where everybody's there, how they were your extent, like the family and the closeness was actually proximity is a crucial part of this story, isn't it? No, I, unquestionably. I, I think um, if people saw what I see on a regular basis, they would want the same things I want. And uh, I mean, I do believe that. I believe that we cannot change the world. We cannot increase justice if we stay in safe places that are distant. We're gonna get it wrong. Our politicians make that mistake. They come up with solutions that aren't effective because they're so far away. They don't hear the things you need to hear when you're proximate to people who are suffering. They don't see the things you need to see when you're in proximity. And I just think orienting people to this concept of proximity is really important. And it's a human concept. You know, this was taught to me by my grandmother. I had one of those amazing African-American matriarchs who was the grandmother in my family. And she was tough and strong, but she was kind and loving. Uh, she was the end of every argument in our family. She was also the start of a lot of arguments in our family. When I was a little boy, I got about nine or 10 and she started worrying about me and she would come up to me and she'd give me these hugs. And she would squeeze me so tightly, I thought she was trying to hurt me. And then she'd see me an hour later and she'd say, uh, Brian, do you still feel me hugging you? If I said no, she would jump on me again. And I didn't appreciate it until I got much older. She lived into her 90s. She worked as a domestic her whole life. And then she fell one day and broke her hip. Then she was diagnosed with cancer, and she was dying. I was in college at the time, and I went to see her. And it was heartbreaking for me to have to say goodbye to her. And I was sitting there, and I was holding her hand. Her eyes were closed. I wasn't even sure she could hear what I was saying, but I was pouring my heart out. 
And I didn't want to leave, but I knew it was time to leave. And I, I got up to leave, and I was about to walk away. And that's when my grandmother opened her eyes, and she squeezed my hand. And then she looked at me, and the last thing she said to me, she said, Brian, do you still feel me hugging you? And then she said, I want you to know I'm always going to be hugging you. And I have felt the embrace of that woman my entire life. And for me, what we're trying to say is that if we get closer to the poor and the excluded and the incarcerated and the condemned and the forgotten and the disfavored, at a very minimum, we can wrap our arms around them and affirm their humanity and their dignity. And that's how you create more justice. That's how you change the world. And we hope this movie inspires people to reach out to the Minnies and the Ralph Myers and the Ray Hintons and the Walter McMillans and the Herbert Richardsons because they're all around us. A big part of this is about poverty uh, and, and, the, and the pressure put on the poor, your character. I mean, you were uh, central to the story, but also completely manipulated by the police and trying to find your way through this. How did you connect to the character and the story? Well, I think it's a very wise question because one of the points that Brian makes in his work is how the, the system in America does turn the white poor, uh, even uh, turn the white poor against African Americans, and how the hegemonic system preserves itself by doing that and by exploiting. Uh, the racism of the poor, the paranoia of the poor, the fear of the poor. And I grew up around that in Oklahoma, uh, in Tulsa, which was the site of one of the worst race massacres in American history, if not the worst, um, in a very segregated uh, city. It re actually remains quite segregated. Uh, and so, just to quote everyone else, uh, just to be a part of telling this story has been an absolute honor. And all of the people at the center of this, from Brian to Destin to Michael, Jamie, Bree, um, they radiate the kind of decency that emanates from Brian's work. Uh, and so, yeah, um, participating in the story as a, 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 a kind of avatar for poor white America and its exploitation and the preservation of white power in America was uh, humbling to get to do and um, a real honor. I think we're just all grateful we got to be a part of this. The thing I liked is that Obviously, prison is brutal, but that wasn't the point of this story. And the, the three of you together, and Shay, talk about this, just those incredible little bridges that moved the story forward and built the humanity, or, or at least connected the audience to the humanity of the characters. What was that like, being able to be in those scenes and, doing, and making that happen? Um, it, you know, it was, uh, it was new, you know, for me as far as the days I'm coming on set. I'm separated from my fellow actors. You know, we gotta kind of bond through these walls. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a surreal feeling when you're laughing and joking behind the camera, but then when you go in into the box and they close the door and you don't see nobody, you know, it's, and it's that quiet from, you know, you're about to start filming. So it's that, that silence right before. And it kind of puts you in there. And I knew that my character, I play Anthony Ray Hinton, he, uh, you know, he was one of the, the dudes on the row, you know, to lift everybody's spirits. And, and Anthony was in prison, wrongfully in prison, for 30 years. You know, the first uh, 14, he ended up getting a ballistic specialist that said that the bullets didn't match the gun that they tried to pin on him. And all that any judge in Alabama had to do was look at this ballistics report, and they didn't. And he had to stay in jail an extra 16 years. So when you think of somebody who's had that much of their life taken away, he had to lose his mother while he was in prison, uh, to still be there to lift everybody's spirits. That just talks about the bond that they had, this family that formed, whether they 
knew they were going to meet each other or not. You know, the circumstances were terrible, but they found each other in their darkest times. And it's just showing that that brotherhood and that relationship. You know, it, it was it hurt to see, you know, your last day on set <laughs> that, you know, it, it, it hurts. You know, I, I, even though I'm happy to see my man Jamie go, it kind of hurts because kind of feel by myself at the end, you know? So it was, uh, it was a special experience and uh, I'm grateful for it. Mike, and the credit to the Destin and, and the writers, man, even though we were in prison, it was still a thread of humanity amongst us, you know? And that's what was actually refreshing in our relationship because a lot of times when black men are depicted in media, it goes straight to the stereotypical thug element which desensitizes people to our existence, which actually opens up the tolerance for them to see us go through all the things that you saw our characters go through. And uh, thankfully, you know, I was playing with these brilliant actors that was open enough to me to accept me because they didn't know me from Jack, you know? Mm. But- uh, <laughs> They know you yeah, now, hey, people know hey, you now. Yeah, but your, your face, your face, the way you, I know this is, I know this is sort of weird to say, but the way you smell, the way the essence of you, we would look at you. We, I, we couldn't look at you because we would immediately become emotional. And, and when we were shooting, I had some guys come down. You know, there were some guys behind that, behind that camera, behind you. There were some serious guys that had been in. And I said, I want you to come down here and I want you to see this and I need your take on what it is. And those guys weeped, you know what I mean? So it's like, I know you say we didn't know you from Jack, but, but man, the whole world is gonna know you. I've been, I told you, my homies, when my homies is watching, it's, it's a homie out here, where you, where you, where you homie at? Stars. Yeah, he back there, he, <laughs> hey, that's a real homie right there. <laughs> And, and, and last night, he watching you, he's like, ah. <laughs> Homies ain't supposed to cry like this. And he started chewing his gum real hard like, <laughs> oh shit, I ain't gonna make it. <laughs> so you, 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 everybody, everybody, but you touch everybody in a, in, a, in a sincere way, man, thank you. Justin, how do you get, I'm curious about the conversations that you two had and how you helped facilitate that. How do you, as a director, producer, let these guys figure out how to do this? Um, you, you set one camera here, <laughs> the other one over here. So not hyper-involved is what you're saying. <laughs> no, but, but uh, we, we actually did do a lot of um, cross coverage with two cameras so that you're capturing every interaction that they're having. We did that with these three guys too, with, with three cameras going at the same time. It's a little technical, but for me, it, what, what it does is it, it allows them to just go. And when, when these two are in a scene, it, I'm, I'm just a member of the audience watching two jazz musicians riff through things and you can just let them go and go. Sometimes we'll just do a scene three times in a row and just see where they go and see what they come up with. And it's, uh, it was just a wonderful thing to be a part of. What kind of conversations do you and Brian have? I think for me it was just, um, <clears throat> I was really curious about the, the space, you know, just being in courtrooms, you know. Um, I have a, you know, I think I had a perception of what that was, you know, from, you know, growing up or, you know, that's a place that you don't belong in. You, you, if you're in a court, it's, it's something bad, you know, so just getting used to, to changing that perception of, uh, to a place of power, um, a place, uh, uh, it's a place of work, you know, really getting into that, to that comfortability in that space, and just ask, asking him, you know, where he would stand, where is his position of attack, you know, depending on what you're trying to get from a witness or a judge, you know, where would you, what, what's your body language, just really getting into the technical aspect of it all, um, <clears throat> because the words are, are the words, you know, um, there's not a lot of ad-libbing, you know, and in, 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 in improv in that space, um, to honor, you know, you know, Brian's work and what actually happened and what was said, so trying to keep focused on that, but then also, you know, leaving room for, um, 
you know, interpretation of that workspace. I think that that's, I guess, where my mind goes. So I, I got a chance to talk to him a lot about that, and and also <clears throat> his approach to clients. You know, when he when he's talking to these inmates, uh, you made the point of getting close. That's something that is extremely important uh, to to understand and feel and and have that empathy and 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 be able to really understand that it's it's more than just a name on a piece of paper. These people have lives, they have families, they have they have things that are at stake and you're responsible for that. Um, the loss of Herbert, you know, was a huge, you know, weight that was on Brian at the time. And knowing that he couldn't stop, he had to continue to think about Walter, he had to continue to think about Ray, he had to continue to think about all these other inmates. Uh, so the balancing act, you know, with the strategy and then the emotional frustration and the emotional restraint, it was those layers that, uh, you know, you know, me and Destin really focused on and really, you know, intentionally wanted to make decisions that way. Um, you know, there's a movie version of this, you know, but then there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a real version of it as well. And we wanted to live more in that space than anything. So just trying to take my time with that. And he was, he was really helpful with that. And, and, and to this young brother right here, who was doing that in real life, balancing, putting the movie together, producing his movie. Uh, I hope he doesn't mind, but at a certain point, I would call it stress, but his, the first day we're shooting, he had, a, he had a pinched nerve that no one could figure out. 45 minutes of sleep before we shot. And he, he, he cared about it so much. If you look at, and I say this to you all the time, what you did in Fruitville Station gave us gives us the DNA of who you are as not only an actor, but an activist. And then to see your, to see his character in Killmonger, who to me, the best villain because of what you stood for at a certain point in the movie, you, it, to, you, you start rooting for you. But it was still that narrative that leads you to something like this. And I think that was amazing. I hope you could talk about the speech, the speech in the courtroom at a certain point, he knew it, it meant so much it, and all of us were supporting him and he's so gracious. He, at one point, he, he was fumbling a couple of lines. He would do something, he'd go, oh, sorry, sorry, y'all. Oh, sorry, bro, bro, sorry, sorry, sorry about that. And at, at one point I pulled him aside, I said, you don't have to say sorry to anybody, this is you. If it take you 30 minutes to say one line, you take it. He goes away, he comes back. He runs a speech, and the whole courtroom erupted, standing ovation. Uh, I went to talk to him, and I touched him on the arm. He, <laughs> and then he just walked off. I said, ooh, that boy, ooh. <laughs> and you know, black people, we call it the Holy Spirit. He got the spirit. <laughs> but I texted him. Remember, I texted him. I said, hey, listen, I know you just did something amazing, and the people uh, and the lady in the fourth, I think it was fourth row, just weeped. And so when, and then even when I talk about all of them, every little thing that you did was, you know, absolutely amazing. You could talk about that speech. I would like to know, I would like to know how you came back up in there and just went for 25 in the fourth quarter. Nah, it, it's, it's when Michael I'm, Jordan. First of all, man. <laughs> man, this is my brother, man. He, uh, he was a, a huge support. You know, system. We were all one big family, and whatever we needed, you know, in that, in that, you know, in the scene, or you know, when we yelled "cut" to get back into the moment, like we were all there for each other, which made this project really, really special to have a whole bunch of selfless actors. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it was a special experience. But what he was talking about is that, um, <clears throat> it's like one of those fi final speeches uh, before we got the, you know, the over overturned um, before Walter got um, released. It was so much weight and pressure in that courtroom. You know, just the atmosphere that was set, the stakes were so high. Looking at these faces, you know, in the back of the courtroom and being there, it was, uh, you know, it was, a, it, it was a high pressure situation for me. You know, you got time, I'm paying attention. Even though, like the producer had, man, we gotta make this shot, we got lunch. <laughs> Lights changed and I'm like, okay, cool, like, the pressure's on, right? So it's like more things, you know, to think about, but that's what we thrive on, that's what we love. And, um, and I was fumbling, you know, a couple of lines and, and Jamie, you know, uh, Pull me to the side and and um, you know you know paraphrasing, but you know you know you ain't got you ain't got to be sorry for nothing. Like you know you know you got this. Go ahead and 
go do what you do. And then, yeah, the, the, pre, the next take, it, it, was, it, was a, it was a really emotional take. Uh, one that didn't make the film, but still, it was, it was, it was, because no, 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 it was, 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 uh, it was, it was very heavy, you yeah. know, it was very, very heavy, you know, and just trying to make, you know, make, make the best out of that situation. But anyway, yeah, I went off in the back and that emotion carried over. Sometimes you just got to let it out, you know, so it was, uh, what did you do? Did you, were you, were you just looking at I yourself was in bawling, the mirror? Yeah. No, I was, yeah, I was crying and I was, it was, it was very, very emotional. I just I had to go kind of let that release, and then I look on my phone, and he got this, he's already text this paragraph, <laughs> and I'm just reading it, and I'm like, oh, man, it's crazy, and I walk back in, yeah. it was a warm reception, but yeah, it was um, one of the, mo the most satisfying moments as an actor for me to be able to be in that space and just know what that, that scene meant to everybody. It was pretty cool. Um, we'll go to questions. Yeah, and so, but that's the beauty of what we do as artists and actors and storytelling, because we just got to do it in play. You know what yeah. I mean? And we got to take the uniform off and, you know, we got to sit around each other and eat and, yeah. you know, go to our hotel rooms and things. This brother did this in real life, man. Yeah. Real life. Like every day. Still today, right now, yeah. still. Could you imagine? Yeah. Unbelievable. And still sitting here just as gracious and humble and beautiful <laughs> and, you know, classy and, <laughs> and seeing stuff like that every day. Every man, day. I couldn't imagine. Go ahead. Hey everyone, Andrea Case, CTV News Toronto. Uh, a couple of things, you talked about your homies not making it through. We're not gonna make it through this news conference because we're bawling right here. Um, question especially for Michael B. Jordan and perhaps all of you, but particularly you. Uh, Jamie talked about emotional finance. And I know from Fruitvale Station, a lot of your earlier films, you die horrible deaths. And it was difficult for your parents to watch you on screen. What is it like for them and perhaps all of your families to see you progress to the point where you are able to do a film like this, which will potentially change so many people's lives. Um, oh man, they're uh, my family's everything. You know, my mom and my dad. They, you know, they they shaped me. They, 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 I am them. You know, um, and yeah, early on in my career, you know, the stereotypical roles that I that I that I played that somehow didn't seem like stereotypes because the characters had so much emotional currency and, and really resonated with audience over time. But my mom, you know, I never thought about like what my mom went through seeing her son die so many times. Seriously, you know, and, and uh, how I would, you know, she would cry so hard and I would talk like, oh man, it would, it would tear me up. And then as I got older and, you know, mature and started looking at things, I was like, man, I can't do this anymore. I, I gotta like, which was actually part of the reason why, you know, I almost like refused a lot of roles that I, I was like, I can't die anymore. I, I just don't want people to see me live. You know, I want, you know, for me to, as a character to, you know, survive all three acts. I want people to watch me actually <laughs> make, make it to the credits. Yeah. But then, and, 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 yeah, so it was, uh, yeah, it was a whole thing. Whole thing yeah. Yeah. Michael uh, Beach. I completely agree with yeah. that. I have not died yet in none of my films. I'm pretty happy about that. <laughs> but that, that same thing you talking about, yeah, I just can't, can't do it. <laughs> Am I right? Michael Beach. Yeah. Michael Beach used to die like every, he would come in dead. <laughs> Let's just bring him on the stretches, man. Michael, we already shot your, uh, your stunt guy. Just lay down and just, okay, put the blood on him. Yeah, Michael Beach. Uh, shout out to Michael Beach, man. He's awesome. Mike, we love you, man. I'm just no, kidding. No. no, but it's one Kinda. of those things where, you, you, know, you know, your audience gets conditioned to seeing you die also, you know? So you, you want to be able to... Uh, you know, put those heroic tones in it, you know, depending on your leading man. That's that's kind of what I was going for. So it was strategic to kind of walk away from some of those roles and start, uh, you know, living. That Good was morning, a great guys. first question. <laughs> Good morning, guys. Katia Woods, Couple Soul Show. The thing that, that always gets me with these movies, yes, it's entertainment and everybody claps, but as people of color, this is our reality. We don't get to have a day off from being black. As much as we like to be just us, the world does not allow us the luxury of that. What do you want, not black people, but this is for like, especially the white actors, like Brie, you get it. A gentleman in the back, you get it. But how do you get people from clapping to being like, don't just be entertained. If you are on an all white jury, what are you doing to say, wait a minute, this doesn't add up. There are so many things in that movie, for instance, I'm like, we already had crime scene investigations during that time. Where is the DNA? Where is anything? 
scientifically that connects anything. You know, local, you know, we all as American citizens, we, we vote, we go in juries. What is the responsibility of people to move the needle and not just sit in the audience and clap and walk out and then go back to doing the same old, same old? You know, I think one of the reasons why I was really uh, grateful for the way Dustin put the film together is, you know, we make statements at the end of this movie. And what we're basically asking people to do is to understand the reality that, that created this story. And I think part of the reason why we have tolerated so much bigotry and discrimination for so long is that we've accepted a narrative about the relative importance of that. And this film is about trying to change that narrative, trying to get people closer to the suffering. When Herbert Richardson is executed, um, you can't not care about the wrongfulness of that. Uh, and, and when you see Karen's performance as a, as a spouse, as a mother, you can't not care about what it would feel like to have somebody you love snatched away from you. And I think that's the challenge, because most people don't get to see it through that lens. That's why I'm so proud of these performances. Jamie's performance as Walt McMillan makes it hard for people to deny the humanity of a condemned man on death row. Uh, you know, Rob's performance does the same thing. O'Shea's performance does the same thing. And that's the challenge. We're in the middle of a narrative struggle. Uh, you know, we uh, are in the United States and in this country, we are still burdened by a history of racial inequality. It's created a kind of smog in the air. We breathe it in every day. And the narratives of racial difference that we have inherited, uh, the native genocide that nobody talked about, uh, two and a half centuries of slavery that we didn't pay attention to. We've got to change that narrative. You know, the great evil of American slavery wasn't involuntary servitude. It was this ideology of white supremacy, this idea that black people aren't as good as white people, that their lives don't matter. And that's why I've always argued that slavery didn't end in 1865. It just evolved. We had 100 years of lynching, segregation, all of that. And today, we're still living at a time where there's a presumption of dangerousness and guilt that gets assigned to black and brown people. But to challenge that, we're going to have to change the narrative. And we haven't done the storytelling part of that. We have 100 Holocaust films, and we need them all. They're beautiful, they're powerful, and we have a consciousness about the Holocaust that changes your relationship to that issue. You go to Germany, you see stones everywhere, you see memorials everywhere. The Germans are trying to change the narrative. They don't want to be thought of as Nazis and fascists. There are no Adolf Hitler statues in Germany. But in this country, we don't talk about slavery, we don't talk about lynching, we don't talk about segregation, we don't talk about race. And it takes storytelling like this to create a comfort zone, a space where we can have these conversations. And what's been amazing, that when we've done a few things, the questions people want to ask are questions about how we change things. What do we do? How do we make a difference? And I think that's the power of this. And I'm thrilled that this industry has created a space and talented directors like Destin and performers like the people here have been willing to take the risk of actually doing something real and authentic. It's not, for me at least, and I think for everybody here, just about entertainment. It's about can we change the environment where justice can actually be achieved? And that's the exciting part for me. And it's for everybody. Because many people of color have given up too. I work in those communities where it's easier to sometimes just not care than to struggle. And as a product of somebody who struggled, you know, line that Michael has in the movie is a real line. We do have to stand up when other people say sit down. We do have to speak when other people say be quiet. Black, white, brown. And that's the theme of the movie that I hope people will see and not only see, but be motivated to take action behind. Um, I'm uh, Bill Newcott from the Saturday Evening Post. And, oh, sorry. You were gonna add oh, to I just, oh, yeah, really quickly, I, I, I think uh, that was just underscoring an aspect of what you said and what Jamie said earlier. I think so much of the success of the movie uh, is, uh, the, the success owes itself to Destin's restraint as a director in, in all the right ways, where there isn't underscoring and he allows scenes between Michael and Jamie simply to play without the movie telling you how to feel. Uh, and it invites the audience into the movie uh, in such a, a, a beautiful way. And, and, and uh, so much credit goes to Destin understanding that that's what Brian's prose does as well in his book. Um, 
And you rarely see that in a movie like this, and it's, I think, really to be admired. Okay, I'm Bill Newcott from the Saturday Evening Post, and Brian, I come here from your hometown of Lewes, Delaware. Um, and I'm like, how have, how have things changed in Alabama, or have things changed in Alabama since the setting of this story? They're doing fake weather maps right now. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't see it? <laughs> they, they, they haven't changed as much. I mean, we've had some success, obviously. We've now gotten 140 people off of death row after being wrongly convicted and unfairly sentenced. And when Jamie asked the question um, at the beginning of the film, how many people have been released from death row, and he answers it by saying none, that was true. And while we've had that impact, um, we still are working with a system that is very resistant to fairness, we still have one of the highest uh, death sentencing rates in the country, one of the highest execution rates. We're in a very hostile political environment. There are 19 appellate court judges in Alabama. None of them are black, even though the state is 28% black. Uh, there's still resistance, but we are fighting. And I think that's the, that's the real change, that there's a community of people. I now have 150 people on my staff. We've opened this museum called the Legacy Museum from uh, slavery to mass incarceration. We have this national memorial and these landmarks have literally changed the landscape. So things have changed, but we're still in the early innings of a real struggle. We are still at the very beginning. And what I keep saying to people is that we're gonna need a whole era of truth and justice. It's not gonna happen on one day. It's not gonna happen in one year. We need a whole era to respond to a half century of mass incarceration and 400 years of racial bigotry, but it won't happen if we don't fight. And what makes me excited is that we're fighting, and now we're fighting with tools that we never imagined were possible. Incredibly talented people, uh, Warner Brothers, this industry contributing in a major way. And people will see this film who are reluctant, but hopefully will come out inspired to do more. Uh, so we're still in the middle. This is a very challenging political moment. Uh, not only in the United States, but across the world. There's a lot of othering going on. There's a lot of hatred. There's a lot of fear and anger. And the politics of fear and anger will make you tolerate things you're not supposed to tolerate. But there's also a response. And I'm thrilled that this is part of that response. You're still fighting judges being appointed today. Absolutely. That are problematic. Yeah. I mean, every, our judges are, are elected. Our prosecutors are elected. I mean, the, it, the Dustin puts the credit in. The sheriff, Tom Tate, yeah. who was the real uh, bad actor who put Ralph Myers on death row and put Walter McMillan on death row, was reelected six times after this story came out. He just retired in 2019. And that's an indictment of people in that community. And that's one of the things that I think folks there are really worried about. But that's the truth. And we got to deal with that. But there's some real movement. We've got a new movement in the US uh, where we're trying to create uh, conviction re review units. That's a big project that we're seeing going on now. At cities all across America are taking that on. We're making prosecutors responsible for responding when somebody says, I'm wrongly convicted, I'm innocent, and it's <laughs> taking off. We're pushing to end immunity for police and prosecutors and judges, which shields them from ever really trying to do better. And uh, that's what I hope this film will also inspire, conversations about those issues. We have a question in the back. Hey guys, way back in the cheap seats. Uh, Russ Nelson, Red Carpet News, and hey you guys. Um, congratulations on a beautiful film. And my question is for Michael, Jamie, and Bree. As Jamie alluded to earlier, you've all had a chance to play in the superhero genre. And I'm curious what those words, heroes and villains, mean to you and how you think this film reflects on that and why it's important to consider how those words affect us in our real lives. I just see people and I just play people I didn't play Captain Marvel because I wanted to be a hero I just wanted to be a person um, and that was a big platform to play a person um, so I don't know I, I feel like when I think of the words like hero I think of Brian you know and I also think of Eva like these are people that are listening and responding to the ground and the people that are around them that are responding with compassion, that are open to being wrong, that are curious, that are ever evolving and growing. That's what I seek when I'm making films because that's my experience. That's what I know. And I think in a world right now where we get very hard on people that grow and change, um, 
to be able to play characters that evolve and to be around real human beings that are growing and evolving, uh, that, that to me is like real bravery and strength and courage. I don't know if that really answered your question, but that's just what I'm thinking about today. I know uh, personally, I told my little cousins that I'm in a movie with Electro, Killmonger, and Captain Marvel. <laughs> and it's going to be real weird when they go to the theater and it's not what they think. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm really appreciative that I got to do something with the three of y'all. It's one of the dopest moments of my life. Thank you. Yeah, I, appreciate I love you too, man. I love you too. Michael's a star. We got time for one more question right here. Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, George. Um, first, you're running a fantastic press conference. I better you up a little bit because I'm going to ask uh, for your forgiveness. As I, before I get to my question for Michael B., I just want to say really quickly, because I don't have the opportunity of seeing Jamie Foxx and Brie Larson every day. I want to thank you, sir, for filling my family and my life with such uh, happiness and joy and tears from your performances, first starting with when I first saw you playing characters like Wandon and Living Color, up to Just Mercy and everything in between. Um, and uh, and, and Miss Larson, whether you're helping kill Thanos or killing it at this festival with fantastic films like Unicorn Store or uh, Room, it's, 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 it's an honor. I want to congratulate everybody involved with this film. It was fantastic. Uh, Michael B., um, if you kind of think of Rush, uh, Mount Rushmore of sorts, there have been four black actors that have won the best lead actor at the Oscars. Poitier, Washington, Fox, Whitaker. A lot of buzz coming out of this festival is that you could be in line to be the fifth. I want to talk about... <laughs> I, I, I get that you don't make a film like this because you're thinking that far in the future. It's because of the relevance, the importance. But I can't like not ask. What, tell me about the significance of that for you and what it's been like working with this ensemble and two former Oscar winners and like what sort of advice that they've given to you as your career continues to soar. Uh, thank you for the kind words, man. Um, you're right. I don't. I don't. I don't. You know. I didn't take this project for with that in mind. You know. It, it was. It was. Um, this man to my right. Honestly, uh, hearing the story and and wanting to be a part of the. Uh, you know, the change. Wanting want to be a part of uh, the effort. You know, to do my part. Uh, like you know, he's a superhero in real life. He does this every day. We 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 play make believe. You know. Um, so just wanting to be a part of that change was was really, really important to me, especially at this time in my life. You know, as a black man in America, you know, these issues directly affect me and my community. And, uh, and really wanting to be, be a part of that process, um, you know, and, and collaborating with, with all of these people on the stage has been, you know, one of the, the highlights of my, of my life, honestly. Uh, it's been really, really special. The award stuff, man, is, um, you know, it's so out of your control. You know, it, it's a, you know, I'm a very competitive person. You know, I, I love sports, you know, video games, all that good stuff. And, uh, you know. Does Jamie dangle the Oscar in front of you? Just <laughs> <in your head? laughs> he actually has it on the front of his Rolls Royce sometimes. <laughs> he actually duct tape it right on the front. No. Um, it, 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 it's, uh, you know, we, I'm a competitive person, but this, this isn't for that. This, spa this space isn't, isn't, isn't a competition to me. You know, it's about, it's about making art. You know, and, and it's really about telling stories and, and being part of just we're really, really lucky for what we do. So, you know, obviously there's, you know, that Mount Rushmore. There, there are those, you know, those actors that have, have achieved that level. And, and of course, to, to, to get that or be able to be a part of that, that company would, would be, you know, amazing. You know, I, I just, you know, I can't let it be at the front of my mind and have it motivate me to make decisions, you know. So, so I just try to stay as honest as I can. If it's for me, it's for me. And, you know, you'll, you'll send me up there if it's, if, if it's meant to be. Thank you, everybody, and thank you. Congratulations. Go Lakers. Thank you, guys.